Nice to meet up at last, Nigel. Thanks very much for um, your time, obviously. But more than that, um, we had some stuff to talk about. Um, well, Penale down in Wales, um, it's not really hit the headlines as such, but I do have some of my family friends who live right next door to where the problem is. And the problem is, of course, the, the, the migrants that are being housed in the Penale, which is an army military transit camp which is used on and off by soldiers sometimes on exercise whatever but they've filled it up with these um illegal migrants whatever you want to call them i'm still not sure what to call them but that's filled up and i sent dan some pictures through of the what must have been half of wales police force policing it so the resources down there um, have pretty much stretched into one little camp when the soldiers that should actually be in that camp are housed in tents. But more than that, um, the, where, the, where they're actually in, in the camp itself, reliable information from a policeman in particular, not direct to me, but yes, they've been burning the sheets inside, they're not happy with the accommodation, They've smashed up the games room. They're sharpening utensils, eating utensils to have a go at the guards. Now they've already they made that statement. That, that's quite clear. And of course, the soldiers <laughs> are now living in tents while they've got the camp, and that isn't good enough for them. So the next step is all these problems with all the police having to go down there and deal with it. And really, this is just one camp out of all of them, Nigel. The army camp thing is new, of course, um, because the first one was Shorncliffe, uh, yeah. just down the road from Houston. Very historic camp, of course. Um, been there a couple of hundred years. The Gurkhas, of course, are there now. Um, I mean, a lot of the camp, a lot of the Shorncliffe camp wasn't being used because it was there from the days of national service. You know, we had an absolutely massive um, yeah. army of people coming in for a couple of years. Um, it's a difficult one because. I exposed the fact that the numbers coming across the channel were increasing, right? Mm -hmm. Because at the time there was almost, a, it seemed like a sort of mainstream media blackout on the story. So I very much exposed it. And then I showed by traveling all around the country, they were being put up in four star hotels at massive expense. Mm -hmm. So the argument for army camps is that it saves money. But problem number one, as you highlight, is they now say that's not good enough because yeah. their mates have got flat screen TVs and on <laughs> suite bathrooms and all the rest of it. I shouldn't be laughing, really. Um, yeah. I, I mean, look, whether, whether people go into army camps or whether people go into private accommodation or whether they go to hotels, the real issue here is that these people have, ent have entered the country illegally. That's point yeah. number one. Yeah. Point number two is that far from the narrative, and there was a big ITV documentary last week about the cross-channel trade, and it's always desperate people, desperate people. Well, I promise you, 85% of those that come are young men under the age of 30. They yeah. don't look very desperate to me. Uh, you know, they're coming into this country, and sure, they may think they're gonna get a better life and more money, although I suspect many of them will finish up in conditions of modern day slavery, ultimately. But, <laughs> We should, we should not be accepting people into this country who come across the channel. Uh, and the other point to make is now they're coming from Albania, from Pakistan, from all over the world, and hardly any of them would ever qualify as refugees. So, you know, the secondary issue is whether we use four-star hotels or army camps. The primary issue is we should not be allowing this to happen. And if you look back to Australia just under a decade ago, they had a similar problem and the australian prime minister said anyone that comes via this route will not be allowed to stay and do you know what the trade stopped so all we get are tough words from pretty patel the home secretary tough words on everything and at the moment no delivery whatsoever nigel i'm in total agreement i mean i'm not just following the um the migrants or anything else the thing is and the, the, the I work with and I know a lot of people who are ex-military. They have a different outlook. 
than maybe some civilians do because they've been there, they've worked with these people, they've sometimes had to um, be in hostilities with different types of people. They can see over the doorstep, they can see what's coming next. Okay, we start off with a few, then we take some more in, then we find that people are helping them across there and dumping them in here. Already, I think we've got, what is it, 5,000, nearly 5,000 this year or something alone. Oh, it's seven and a half thousand this seven, year. Sorry, seven and a half thousand, which is more and than that's last year. Again, yeah. 2,800 last year yeah. and 300 the year before that. So, yeah, as you say, you so, can see the trajectory. It's almost like there's a great big sign on the White Cliffs of Dover which says, anybody, you know, anyone's welcome. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's exactly right. And you know what? While you're there, get your wallet out. We'll fill it up for you and we'll send you on your way. When does that stop? You know, when do the, our security <laughs> of the people who are worried, like little Penali, never seen anything like this. They're terrified to go out. Absolutely terrified. On You know, they can't live their own life in their own country, which all of them, Wales, England, Ireland, Scotland, you name them, have all fought for the country. Now we're having to hide from people, you know, people who are directly threatening people. How does that happen? How is that allowed to happen? And there's little worms that can't do anything about it in parliament and government. Why don't they stand up and grow a pair and actually lay down like Australia? You know what? You're here. Don't unpack your bags, OK, because you ain't staying here. Brexit gives an opportunity to overcome something yeah. called the Dublin regulations. Now, without yeah. getting too technical about this, you know, yeah. as it stands at the minute, if people, as EU, even though we're not EU members, we're still bound by EU rules until the 31st of December. All right. Yeah. yeah. Now, now, from 1st of January 2021, we do not have to accept anyone into this country, even if they haven't claimed asylum previously in a European country. So we then, from January the 1st, can start a policy of returns. We're trying to negotiate a deal with the French uh, to allow this to happen. But guess what? The French aren't very keen on doing the deal. So we will know within a few days of the new year whether all the promises that have been made by the Home Secretary amount to a row of beans or not. And at the minute, I have to say, I'm pretty sceptical. Uh, I'm sceptical, more than sceptical, because I'm working with veterans all the time. And it's not just about veterans, by the way, but they have, I, I do a lot with them and the charities that I'm involved with. And I find that everybody, bar none, are worried about what's going on. Okay, the other one was, um, European Defence Union, which has had a lot talked about it. <laughs> um, well, no, no, <laughs> no, you're wrong. This is the problem. It's not had enough talked about it. So, yeah, OK. You, you know, because I remember, I remember doing a head to head yeah. with the Deputy Prime Minister, Nick Clegg, in 2014. And I said one of the reasons I didn't want to be in the European Union is they were heading towards a full European army. Yeah. and. That was called by Clegg a dangerous fantasy. Well, they might not be calling it a European army, but they are calling it a European Defence Union. And what concerns me is with our final withdrawal deal from the European Union, it looks like our senior politicians and some of our top brass in the military want us to stay a part of this. And what they can't see is that that presents a direct threat to NATO. Yeah. Now, NATO may not be perfect, but it has served us pretty well over seven decades and more. Um, and it's kind of, you know, oh, well, don't pay 2% of GDP to defence. You don't need to, because there'll be economies of scale within the EDU. And no wonder Trump is saying, this can't go on. You know, this can't go on. It can't go on with America paying more than its fair share and the other members not proportionately doing so. So I actually think, Rusty, that on European defence, we need a much bigger debate than we've had. Uh, yeah, well, uh, yeah, in a nutshell, that, that's exactly right. I, yeah, no, no question. But <clears throat> for the, the questions that have been asked in the past 
And I did one with Anne Widdicombe um, not long ago and spoke to Ian Duncan Smith not too long ago on a Zoom meeting. We've gone through an awful lot of stuff, but we cannot serve two masters. So yeah. we, we leave the European Union and we end up possibly, certainly the military, which I'm looking at as well, being left as part of the EDU. You can't serve two masters. The constant lie in Brussels is that the EDU will work in parallel with NATO. Life does not work like that. And there are many inside the European Union yeah. who loathe the Americans. They resent the fact the Americans liberated them. It's bizarre psychology, but it's true. Um, and yeah, I, you know, we need to have a very, very big, a very much bigger national public debate about this. And a lot more figures in politics and current affairs need to acknowledge even the existence of the EDU. You know, we've seen, haven't we, the parachute regiment, you know, going on exercise and, and actually having European Union badges on their sleeves. Uh, we need to raise the issue of this. And, and, and I'm pretty sure uh, that if Trump wins re-election, uh, this will become a bigger issue. Um, yeah, agree. And also, you're talking about the badges on the arm. It was me... They exploited that a couple of weeks ago when I saw the um, the clip of the integration training with the military. The yeah. next one they had two weeks later, those badges were covered up with just a green slip with nothing on there at all. So when they come off camera, they're just going to take them off. And underneath yeah. is going to be the EU flag again. And, you know, the joint um, integration, if you like. Well, you know what? We fought a couple of wars, but we won them. And who wants, which it looks like, Germany to rule the roost? Germany are the dominant power in the Union, and that was no doubt. Um, and we voted to leave. So our politicians should take note and leave. logically should, should, should say that a vote to leave is a vote to leave European Defence Union. We'll see. I suspect this is a battle that will have to be fought hard over the next couple of years. But if we can leave, it means that we've probably got our troops and our uh, military, you know what, to secure our shores and our borders. We don't need to secure their borders. They've got enough. Go and secure your own borders. You know, we've got well, to do our, our own border. We can get little Mickey Mouse fishing boats come across, dumping people off, and that's okay. No, it ain't okay. No, it's not okay. The, the fact is, anybody bigger than that, they're just going to walk in and walk over the, the Great Britain that we made great. And that's why I had the name Great Britain in there. At the moment, it's a laughing stock. Well, I just look, you know, it, 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 even aside from the EDU, you know, we've got a massive running down of the arm of the armed forces. We've yeah. seen it you know, since 2010. Remarkable yeah. <laughs> amount of reduction in, in, in all of the, in, in all of the three services. Uh, proposals now to cut the army to seventy five thousand. Uh, proposals to cut the navy to almost a laughable size. So we've got issues with defence all round. I think not just the EDU, but our own capabilities as well. Because we get to a point with this, and we, and we, and we may be at it arguably now, where even in terms of NATO. America starts to take us a lot less seriously, and that would be a massive headache for us going forwards. Now, I totally agree. Uh, you know, they're talking about, was it another 7,000 troops going, something like that? Where are they going yeah, to? Yeah. You know, what's going to happen to all these yeah. people? Politicians think the public don't care about this issue. That's, that's, the, that's the calculation. The calculation is people don't care about defence and don't care about the armed forces. That's what Westminster thinks. I suspect they're wrong. The point is being brought out uh, um, by lots of people. And again, the politicians go to ground. If they're not going to lead, who is going to stand up and lead? That's the debate that has to happen. And if people care about it, yeah. then, then they have to talk about it. They have to voice their concerns. They have to pressure their members of parliament. You know, things only change. Nothing, I mean, unless people... Unless people, you know, let the establishment know what they think through their vote or through campaigning or through letter writing or through lobbying MPs or through whatever it is, unless people stand up and fight for things, they're not going to get them. And I think that, that we are reaching a very critical moment um, in terms of our defence capabilities. Absolutely.
Well, I, I, I'm really glad you've taken the time today, Nigel. It's, it's a pleasure to talk to you. And you, and, Nigel. Uh, you know, keep banging the drum for the forces because someone needs to, all right? Thank you very much for your support. Thank you.